Hey everyone, Brian Zane here, and it's time for another classic pay-per-view revisited. You might recall back in November of 2018 when I first put out my review of Halloween Havoc 1998, which of course is headlined by the double main event of Hulk Hogan versus The Ultimate Warrior and Diamond Dallas Page challenging Goldberg for the WCW Championship. Well, it was in October of last year where the video got blocked, and I've been trying ever since then to get the video unblocked, going into the little editor function, trying to snip out all the different stuff that the algorithm says, no, no, you can't have that. And after all this time spent, fruitlessly, I might add, where we've been making all these cuts and the YouTube algorithm gods say, no, thank you, it is still blocked. Uh, to the point now where even if this video was able to be unblocked and available to the masses once again, the things that I would say about the biggest matches and the things you want to hear the most about would be so chopped up and incoherent that there's not even a point of having the, that video back up. It would the, the meaning of it would be gone, basically. So after fighting it for more than a year, I finally decided, screw it, let's just make a new review from the ground up. So not only did I re-watch Halloween Havoc 98, I even watched some of the TV leading up to it, which I didn't do five years ago. So I had an even better understanding and kind of background as to what we saw on this show. So five years after my initial review, time to once again look at this show and see if my thoughts on Havoc 98 have changed at all. The show took place at the MGM Grand's Garden Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. It took place October 25th, 1998. The show just recently celebrated its 25th anniversary. 10,000 plus packed in the Garden Arena, sold out for months. 310,000 pay-per-view buys is on the lower end for 98 pay-per-views in WCW, but still is the height of their success in that world. And once again, every time it shows up, I've got to bring attention to it because it just deserves to be brought up. That set, that iconic Halloween Havoc set, nothing comes close to it in my opinion in terms of just embracing the theme and the whimsy of that concept of the Halloween theme. You got the goblin with the, the wings and everything, or maybe it's a ghoul or a demon, something like that, cradling the giant inflatable uh, pumpkin, the jack-o'-lantern with the giant headstones for screens. It's just an iconic look. WWE wishes that their sets could look anything like that today. Tony Schiavone, Bobby Heenan, and recent Impact Wrestling Hall of Famer Mike Tenay on the call here. Great opening stand-up by these guys. Heenan says his piece puts on a mask as Tony and Mike keep talking. Schiavone snaps the mask into his face. It's great stuff. We get a Nitro Girls performance. It's not the last we'll see of them tonight. Mean Gene is on the stage, welcomes Rick Steiner to be interviewed about his upcoming match with Scott in the show, but then Buff Bagley well interrupts. He says he's sick of Big Papa Pump just like Rick is. We have been seeing on TV for the last couple of months the interactions with Buff Bagwell who's back from his neck injury and he's you know been a member of the NWO hanging out with Scott Steiner but lately those two have been at odds. In fact recently Bagwell's mother Judy was making some appearances in WCW Scott parading her right in front of Buff's face. Finally we see Buff taking a big swing at Scott with a chair this past Nitro. So here Buff says he wants to join Rick at ringside and say nuts to the NWO. Rick doesn't trust Buff, but Bagwell assures him that his intentions are pure. They shake on it and the fans either they're booing because they can see the swerve coming from a mile away or they're barking because it's the dog-faced gremlin. I can't really tell. <laughs> Well, apparently a little solidarity here. Finally, we get our first match of the evening for the TV championship. Chris Jericho defending against Raven. It's the battle of the dubbed themes. Knockoff Nirvana versus knockoff Pearl Jam. <laughs> Not on Peacock, buddy. Interesting sign on display here saying Raven equals the NWO. Uh, okay, Raven is a baddie, but he's been on a big losing streak as of lately, which they keep bringing up on commentary and in Raven's pre-match promo. Raven complaining about about being scheduled in an unscheduled match, in his words. He says he wasn't given enough notice, so he's not going to wrestle. Quote the Raven, I'm out of here. Jericho on the mic cuts him off, says he does not want to disappoint the Jericho Holics by not wrestling. He says Jericho equals buy rates and 
rock and roll. He finally goads Raven back into the ring by calling him a loser, which is apparently all it takes, and the match begins. Jericho's off to a hot start, but Raven fights back. Both tumble to the outside, Raven running up the steel steps and drop kicks Jericho. Jericho just shouting, help me! But he went like a lawn dart. Jericho with his triangle drop kick to the outside, going for a dive off the apron, but eats the barricade. Irish whip counter and Raven takes the guardrail as well. Raven now using his own flannel shirt as a weapon. Ooh, that grungy kid. Chris has removed the turnbuckle pad, but it backfires as he gets slingshot into the exposed bolt. Raven is close, but not enough to win. The pace picks up. Both guys looking really good here. Jericho with a lion tamer locked in. The crowd's loving it, but Raven gets the ropes. Raven hits the even flow, but Jericho kicks out. Jericho with a blatant low blow, the first of several on this night. We get a German with a bridge. Raven kicks out. Raven's buddy Canyon shows up all of a sudden. He's on the apron and is immediately knocked off. Jericho with the lion tamer back on and Raven taps. Jericho retains. I give it three stars out of five. Like I said, for a heel versus heel match with no build to it other than that, oh, it's a championship match. It was pretty well executed. I think that the fans kind of determined who they liked based on, on what they saw in the matchup there. But uh, I think that these guys had really good chemistry and the pacing, especially near the end, was great for me to see here. It won't be too long long before Raven's character takes a bit of a twist where we find out he's kind of a spoiled trust fund kid. His kayfabe mom will show up and bring him home to their palatial estate and Canyon's going to be just kind of stupefied by all this. What a mark! It's time to hear from Hollywood Hogan and Eric Bischoff, who is now sporting a new haircut. Last couple of weeks, Bish has been getting humiliated on Nitro. First, he was arrested and kicked out of the Allstate Arena in Chicago, then was kicked out by the mayor of Minneapolis the following week, showing no signs of shame or anger or embarrassment or even acknowledgement of either of those things here, though. Now, last week, Hogan beat the hell out of his nephew, Horace, who we just saw on TV for the first time. He says he left him bloody last week because he hadn't put in the sacrifices Jack brother and he says you have to be worthy to be an NWO white dude. He turns his attention to the warrior and tells him he's going to leave him laying tonight and then after his music starts playing he cuts a post promo promo into the camera. A bonus promo. Up next, a big hoss fight as Wrath takes on the man called Ming. People complain looking back about this show and saying that there's a lot of matches that could have been cut because, you know, there's no heat, there's no build. This match is lumped into that category, but there is definitely, like, there is a story going into this matchup. It wasn't just thrown in for no reason because the story they've been telling on TV is that Meng is this just unstoppable monster and who's going to stop him? Like, oh, here's this other big guy, Wrath, who's also on a bit of a hot streak. Let's have them just put them together and see what happens. And you know, the build isn't too clever beyond that, but you don't need that sometimes. It's physical from the get-go. Wrath even hits a rolling senton off the apron. One clothesline's got no effect, but a diving one takes Meng down briefly. Meng with his patented kick of fear, according to commentary. The clubbing continues back and forth. Big-ass back suplex by Meng. Wrath of the big Uranagi keeps trying to go for the meltdown. He gets him up after a big struggle and just throws him down. Wrath wins. One and a half stars out of five for me. You know what? The match was not the most amazing thing in the world, but I still think it got the job done for a Hoss fight. You know, I liked the big smacks. I liked the big slams and that finish at the end, the fight for the meltdown and just seeing him get the big dude up was really cool to see. So I have to give him props for that. The cruiserweight champ Billy Kidman is in the web zone here to scout his future opponent for the evening as Disco Inferno takes on Juventud Guerrera. The winner here takes on Kidman for the title later tonight. It's fairly even handed to start things off. Disco getting some shine, Hoovy gets some shine. They do stumble with a move, but they do it over and pull it off. Hoovy with a cool head scissors off the apron onto the floor, but it does look like, you know, you can't see where he actually hits the ground, but that bump did look like it hurt. Disco doing a lot of shtick in this match to the annoyance of all three announcers for very different reasons. Hoovy outmaneuvers Disco who tries to avoid a dive but takes one anyway. Counters upon counters until Disco slips away, hits a swing and neck breaker. Disco does the Macarena but almost gets caught with a pin. There's a giant swing. Dizzy Disco drops down to the dick. Damn. Disco goes up top but takes too long. Hoovy catches him, mounts his big offensive run but Disco hits a beautiful leaping pile driver and pins to win.
I give it three and a half stars out of five. I really enjoyed the nonstop pace that this match took. I think these guys worked really well together. I think Disco might have, you know, hit that joystick for the taunt action a little bit too often in this matchup here. But I was surprised that he won clean as a whistle. You know, there was really no cheating for Heat by Disco. All he had to do was dance. So I guess that's uh, one way of doing it. We get another Nitro Girls performance. Gosh, I wonder how this show could have run so long. The NWO music plays and Scott Steiner shows up for some promo time now. He talks about his freaks, about how he's in town and ready to pound. He speaks on Bagwell joining up with Rick and now he ups the ante and wants to make tonight's match a tag team battle with he and the Giant for the tag belts. Giant pops in now and says some Don't stuff. JJ Dillon shows up to confirm if they're that confident to put the belts on the line and says that if Rick and Buff win the match then Rick will finally get Scott in that one-on-one -on -one match right after. In a battle to see who's the best European wrestler, Fit Finley takes on Alex Wright. It was meant to be Wright versus the British Bulldog, but what happened at Fall Brawl 98, that infamous moment where the British Bulldog seems to hurt his back on the trap door in one of those rings, and uh, he tries to work through it for several weeks after the fact, but at a certain point he cannot do it any longer because he is on TV for part of this build, and then he's just gone, and so we have Fit Finley taking his place. By the way, it's very interesting how teams and alliances don't necessarily mean they're always on the same page or doing the same stuff. Like, for example, Wright and Disco Inferno are on a tag team together, but they don't really interact at all on this show. You've got, you know, Sting has the NWO Wolf Pack, you know, by his side normally, but he's just kind of on an island fighting Bret Hart by himself. Same with Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. It's just very interesting how you got these team alliances and allegiances, I should say, but you know, they're not always just like joined at the hip because they have that teammate. Nice back and forth early on. Beautiful athleticism by Wright with that arm drag. We get a boring chant at one point, but I'm not sure what match these folks are watching. Finley begins to stretch Das Wunderkind out and dumps him outside. They fight out there for a bit. Back in the ring and moments later, a big collision in the ropes has them both outside again. Each man missing a big move, but Finley makes the final mistake and Wright takes advantage to drop him and win. I give this match two stars out of five. There were some fun moments in the early going, but after a certain point, it felt like it could have gone to another gear and didn't quite get there. This is another match you could kind of say didn't have the proper build because it was supposed to be Alex versus the Bulldog, but Finley was involved in this as well, but maybe not as intensely until last minute. So not exactly a no build matchup, just not exactly what they were going for at the time. Ernest Miller's in the web zone here. He's being grilled by Lee Marshall about his nickname. Says there's somebody else called the greatest. There's somebody else called the real deal. But the cat doesn't care about that. He also admits to beating up fans, apparently. I'm six to five and zero against the guys in the locker room. I'm five and zero against the overweight fans. <laughs> I'm the greatest. You're Former flock members do battle next as Lodi takes on Saturn, who's coming out with what Shivani calls a combination tough guy army ranger look. The match is underway, Lodi noticing that one of the crew members has grabbed his signs and has to run back up the ramp to get them. Saturn early on holding A and B to do the leg sweep. Lodi powders and grabs his sign saying that he likes Texas. Sure, okay, we're in Nevada, but whatever. He keeps messing around with his signs until Saturn's had enough and goes out there to get him. Saturn hitting him with that suplex Township that does Lodi in and Saturn wins handily. One star out of five here. Now, this is a match you could definitely say, yeah, take it off the pay per view. No reason for it to be there. But hey, Saturn can definitely throw a mean suplex. They look good doing that. We get a recap of the Buff Bagwell Steiner Brothers storyline here. Then more Nitro Girls? Then not even a full half hour has passed since his last match, but Disco Inferno's being brought back out again to challenge for the Cruiserweight Championship held by Billy Kidman. By the way, can I just say that Kidman's theme at this point sounds like it came straight from like a Super Nintendo fighting game. Kidman's off to a strong start, taking down Disco multiple times, many stomps. Disco hits a neckbreaker and does some trash talk, implying that Kidman is a child. I mean, it is in his name. On the outside, Kidman with an inventive bulldog by posting off the steel steps. Disco get that advantage and goes back to taunting between every move. It cots him eventually, though, and allows Kidman to come back again. Disco learns that you don't powerbomb Kidman, but still recovers and hits that pile driver, but he's too tired to capitalize on time. Kidman 
goes to the big bulldog again, but it's a reverse at the last second. Nice. Come on, man. Not only do you not powerbomb Kidman, you definitely don't powerbomb him after doing the Macarena. The face buster, the shooting star, the win by Kidman. I give it three and a half stars out of five. Thought it was a pretty entertaining cruiserweight match, very similar to the one with Hoovy and Disco. I think that, uh, I don't mean this with any kind of snark or ridicule. I think that this night is one of Disco Inferno's best career accomplishments to be able to have those two matches in a relatively short time frame. Like, I thought that was crazy that they had him go back out there like a half hour or less after his previous one. Like He's just toweling off, it looked like, but he was still able to go, and I think wrestling two very different competitors Competitors in Hoovy and Kidman and making them both look good uh, at the end uh, while just you know getting his heat dancing all the time. I think that was a really good just night's work for him. Time now for the big premiere of Conan's new music video and boy for a show that is known for going heavy and being cut off in about a quarter of the live viewers homes that night. You start to look at all the different things where you go huh I wonder what they could have cut to maybe save some time and go a little bit lighter on the rundown here. They, they cram a lot of different things into this show. But in all seriousness, talk about how important it was for Conan to represent the NWO and WCW as this embodiment of what's cool and hip. No doubt it connected with the younger kids at the time. He's in a good spot here doing this video. In a match for the WCW Tag Team titles, Scott Steiner and the Giant of the NWO defend against Rick Steiner and Buff Bagwell. Steiner is filling in for Scott Hall, who is officially the co-champion of the Giant, but they say, hey, NWO rules, kind of like Freebird rules, anyone can possess that belt. But this all stems from earlier in the year at Super Brawl when Scott Steiner turned on his brother and joined the NWO, became a big Papa Pump. Rick has been on the war path and has been dying for a match with Scott ever since. They were supposed to get one at Fall Brawl, but it ended in a big schmoz and very inconclusive. And so, we were supposed to get the one-on-one -on -one here, but again, they have turned it into this kind of diversion, making it a tag team match. Fine, whatever. Now the Giant is smoking cigarettes again. Wow, he looks so cool. Oh, and one more thing to talk about, which is, of course, very important to the build of this matchup. You had this infamous moment on Nitro where Rick Steiner was being interviewed and was cut off by a pre taped video of Chucky, the killer doll from the Child's Play franchise, as they were plugging Bride of Chucky, and they were saying Scott Steiner was going to be the star of Chucky's next movie. I'm not sure how that works out. I thought Chucky was the star of the Chucky movies. Would Scott Steiner have been killed in that movie had he been, you know, in the next, you know, Chucky movie, next Child's Play movie? Would he have been turned into a talking killer doll like big papa pumps a little doll's gonna kill you and cut your throat holla if you hear me scott only enters the ring to beat up rick once the giant has softened him up scott working his brother over until rick fights back just laying into him with that clothesline buff suddenly wants to make a tag in and bam takes his own partner to dick kick city i love the uh just the energy in the announcer's call when this happens where bobby heenan's just like well he, he, he tricked us again. Wow. And Tony Schiavone going, many of you expected this was coming. Like, why would you bury this? I mean, obviously, it's a very easy setup. You can see it from a mile away. But why would you bury it like that on commentary? Buff does his dance and runs away as Scott hits Rick with a running dick kick city. Jesus. Giant with some big double stomps toying with Rick as the announcers openly discuss if Judy Bagwell is in on the plot. Is she NWO for life? Rick comes back until he gets hit in the ball so the third time this match. Giant taking about 12 minutes to get up on the top turnbuckle so he can go for this massive missile drop kick, but he hits his own partner instead. Rick with many Steiner lines, the Bulldog to the Giant, the cover and the win. In. Rick Steiner has just won the tag titles by himself and gets 15 minutes with Scott right now. But in the meantime, I'm going to give this match two stars out of five, a pretty well executed handicap match. But again, Buff's involvement or his lack thereof, his very early betrayal, very silly, but it gets sillier. So Rick going to town on Big Papa Pump until we get a fourth nut shot. Scott jumping up at one point. Rick catches him in midair, slams him down. Suddenly a man in a suit and a Bill Clinton mask has shown up to ringside, beating up security. He hits Rick with a slapjack and it's Buff Bagwell again. Why did he leave and come back in a whole new disguise? Why didn't he just come back as Buff Bagwell? What was the point? You've already, you've already turned heel. Just go out there. 
But the baddies can't even cheat right as Buff does a weekend at Bernie's with the referee, but still counts too slowly. Rick fights back, hits the bulldog on Scott. Nick Patrick comes in and makes a three count. I also give this one two stars out of five. Buff's involvement in this entire segment was some of the goofiest stuff. I'll never understand. Like again, the betrayal is so easy to spot, and then he come he leaves and comes back with the disguise. I've never seen that done before, and I don't quite understand why he did it that way. Um, but yeah, Rick is looking really strong here. Like I mentioned, they really buried the lead with the fact that the tag titles changed in this match as well. He would select Kenny Chaos, a young up and comer from the power plant as his co-tag team champion, but eventually Chaos would get injured, and that means Rick has to choose a new co-champion. And he is in the midst of a feud with Buff Bagwell at that point, so he decides to select Buff's own mother, Judy, as a champion, mostly as a way to kind of fuck with Buff's head. But hey, you cannot say that Buff Bagwell does not love his mother. He got her so many paydays in WCW. Former best friends collide as Scott Hall takes on Kevin Nash. Earlier in the year, Hall chose his side in the NWO faction warfare. He betrayed his good friend Nash mid-championship match, costing them the tag team titles and decided to not join the Wolf Pack and instead stay with NWO Hollywood. In the ensuing months, they have started to really incorporate Scott's real-life substance abuse problems, in particular his drinking, into storyline. He has become Last Call Scott Hall. He is showing up, whether it's a shoot or not, he is on television looking wasted, throws up on Eric Bishop off at one point showing up with a beverage in his hand and the go home episode of Nitro he spends most of the time talking to some people at the bar at the arena they're really leaning into it it's not the first case of a wrestler's you know substance abuse problems being used in storylines obviously the WWF was doing it with Jake Roberts before this and so this feels like kind of the next logical step in that and we've seen this in recent years how often they bring it up with Jeff Hardy so it's obviously not the first time but considering Considering that Scott Hall was still going through these problems, oh, we can't forget Hawk in the WWF in 98 as well. So all these different examples, but like with Hawk and with Scott Hall, they're like actively going through these problems right now. It's like at least with Jake, he was doing rehab or trying at the time. And at least with Jeff Hardy, he was also in that process as well. But with the case that Scott Hall was in at the time, it seems very irresponsible for them to kind of lean into that. And, you know, Bischoff has said multiple times, it's one of the few things as a creative individual in wrestling that he really regrets and trying to bring that into storyline. Hall comes to the ring with a drink in his hand, throws it in Kevin's face and tunes up the band. I don't know why I decided to sing it. The lone wolf bonks Nash in the head with David Penzer's mic and chokes him out with a cord. Nash now seems to be coughing up blood and is beaten to the point of incapacitation as Hall takes the mic and asks him how it feels to see through foggy eyes. See, because there's fog on the ground. Nash finally enters the ring, taking punishment for a good while. Nash takes punch after punch, begs for more, finally catches Scott with a sidewalk slam. He goes to the jackknife, but Hall is able to slip away and powder for a moment. Some interesting body language by Hall as Nash continues to stay in the fight. Not entirely sure what I'm supposed to be reading from that, though. Nash has some knees in the corner. Would you like a double? Bam! Bam! Get you some! Scott is getting worn down to the point of his blows doing nothing. That allows Nash to hit the big boot. The jackknife makes it a double. Then he tells Hall to suck it, leaves the ring, and walks away, getting himself counted out and allowing Scott Hall to win. I give it one star out of five. It is a slow, rough to watch at times matchup here. You could tell that these fans did not want to see the outsiders fighting each other. I think that, uh, yeah, it was just very, the story they were trying to tell with it, I was kind of confused, a little too clever for me because you saw some of the facial expressions Scott Hall had earlier in the match, like what was that supposed to signify? And then Nash, instead of just doing the one, two, three, which I think would have, you know, made a statement and possibly, you know, taught Scott a lesson or whatever. The fact that Nash kind of leaves him laying and walks away, like maybe because he's still like deep down has, you know, the friendship bond, or maybe he proved his point. Uh, it just seemed like it was kind of too clever for the situation. We see the Nitro Girls again, and speaking of things we see again at this time, Sting was once again betrayed by none other than Brett the Hitman Hart. We were finally getting a Brett Hogan match on Nitro 
Nitro when Brett looks to be injured partway through, gets his good friend and good buddy Sting, who he has publicly said he respects so much, gets the Stinger to take his place, and soon enough, Brett costs Sting the match and turns heel. It's amazing I forgot to include this happening in my entry about Sting and all the betrayals against him in my Worst of Sting countdown. Also, why would you want to make Brett a bad guy after he came in with all that crowd support after Montreal? If it's not to make Hulk Hogan and gang happy, then I don't know what other reason you would have for that. It's like, keep Brett a babyface because people want to cheer for him after what happened. Brett and Sting have definitely had some brawls the last couple of weeks leading to this, but now as the match begins, we get a lot of stalling by Brett. Sting finally getting a hold of him, though. Brett turning things around and takes over, just wearing down Sting for the longest time. Brett goes for a missile drop kick, but Sting catches him and gets him in the Scorpion Deathlock, but a quick rope break. Brett appears to hurt his leg on a leapfrog. It's an obvious ruse as Brett pulls out some brass knuckles of some kind, drops them for Sting to try and use them, but the referee stops him. That allows Brett to punch Sting in the wiener. Man, they love doing this camera tilt when somebody is selling. We see a lot of it on the show. Sting gets his ass kicked for most of the match. He accidentally decks the referee, who then takes a Brett leg drop. Okay, then he's dead. Then to add to that, we get a big superplex by Brett off the top and they land partially on Billy Silverman's legs. Sting hitting a splash in the corner, but also knocks himself out. That allows Brett to grab Sting's bat, hitting Sting five times with it, then again off the second rope. Silverman is revived and Sting has clearly been murdered as Brett puts him in the sharpshooter and the referee calls it for the hitman. I give it two stars out of five. This match was really boring, which is terrible to think about because you look at these two guys on paper, Bret Hart and Sting, two tremendous workers in their own right. Uh, you know, Sharpshooter versus Scorpion Deathlock. This writes itself, and you would think the match would actually be good as a result. Sadly, that was not the case for whatever reason. I think especially the finish was kind of hard to swallow. I mean, five shots with a bat is really excessive for anybody, especially somebody like Bret Hart, who has been a heel before, but may never have had to resort to those kind of tactics in the past. It just seemed a bit much, honestly. Jackie Crockett screams at a cameraman who walked into the hard cam shot as the stretcher arrives for the stinger. Let's just keep slowing this show down, folks. Uh, Billy Silverman's even asking for a bell here to get some help out, to try to get some attention out. Coming up in the semi-main event, it's certainly being billed and hyped, though, as if it is the premier matchup on this show. And look at it on paper, it's hard to argue that because this is a tremendous rematch eight years in the making as the NWO's Hollywood Hogan takes on The Warrior, formerly The Ultimate Warrior, but now just The Warrior for trademark purposes. Warrior showed up to WCW in September to start his program with Hulk Hogan. We got the War Games match and the body double and the smoke screens and everything. Then in the weeks that followed, we got even more magic tricks. Warrior kidnapped the disciple, made him part of the One Warrior Nation, which then it became a Two Warrior Nation, but don't asked too many questions about that. He set a bunch of small fires in Hogan's dressing room. Then, of course, there was the magic mirror spot. It seemed to me just very much reeked of Dungeon of Doom. A lot of these cheesy angles and everything, which I felt they played pretty straight, and they acted as if we were meant to take it seriously. Warrior and Hogan certainly played it seriously, I would say. Uh, but the fans didn't seem to respond in kind, because as you see and hear the reactions for Warrior as TV progresses and as the weeks go on, the fans ain't really cheering for Warrior anymore by the time we get to Halloween Havoc. Also, watching back at this time period for WCW is like fascinating to me because like I've talked before, 1998 was my first year as a wrestling fan and I really tried to ingest as much as I could and I do have a lot of vivid memories of 98 for both WWF and WCW, but for whatever reason, I have no recollection or any feigning, any memory of any interest in Hogan Warrior at this point. Maybe a lot of it had to do with the fact that like, you know, I didn't watch them in their prime, so seeing them have their feud, like it didn't connect with me at the time because I didn't know the history. Uh, so maybe that didn't resonate with me quite as much because I do remember DDP and Goldberg. I remember that stuff. I, I remember to an extent Chris Jericho and his whole shtick. I remember him challenging Goldberg, AKA Greenberg to stuff. But like for some reason, I have like zero recollection of any of the build as it 
was happening, you know, involving Warrior and Hogan. And yeah, it's like it's 25 years have passed and, you know, who knows how many head injuries I've suffered over the years. So it's possible I maybe had so seen it and just forgot it. But yeah, for some reason, I just wasn't watching Nitro those times of nights. And as I mentioned in the Go Home Nitro, Hogan showed how evil of a man he was when he beat the crap out of his own nephew, Horace, the son of his own dead brother, they'll tell you every other sentence, and left him in a pool of blood. Remember that now. The target is scoped and locked for destruction. I'm kind of confused by the way Warrior's theme begins at this time period. You hear, so it sounds like the clip from a movie or something he might have been in where he says, the target is scoped and locked in, take the target out. But wait a minute, why are you doing this like military sniper thing when you're also trying to be Batman? Because you've got the Warrior signal in the sky, you're talking about same Warrior time, same Warrior place, and same Warrior channel but also locked and loaded, take the target out. What? A lot of gab by the Hollywood stir as we start things off. Warrior takes him down with a punch and the match is officially on. We get one interaction and then more Gaga, a lock up and Hogan begins to pound away at his opponent. Works him into the test of strength spot, which Warrior powers out of, but he gets cut off. Hogan goes, ha 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 ha. <laughs> There's a lot of evil laughter by Hogan in this matchup. They crisscross. It's the most athletic thing they do all match. They trade body slams. Action spills to the outside and they meander. Mike Tanay lying on air by calling everything before this a fine wrestling match. A fine wrestling match has turned into an out and out fight. Back in the ring, we immediately get a ref bump and the Patrick flop. Hogan copies Brett's homework from earlier, gets his own move off on the referee. Hogan calling in the giant who is soon disposed of. Stevie Ray is down, Vincent's down, but Hogan drops Warrior with a suplex, whips Warrior with the weight belt until Nick Patrick gets in between them. This sequence of Hogan trying to elbow drop Warrior who acts like a steamroller is just sad to watch. Warrior comes back using Hogan's belt against him, Hogan now bleeding as he crawls away to the corner to dig out some flash paper, and it famously goes horribly wrong. The flash paper doesn't work right at first, it goes off in Hogan's own face, it goes over like a fart in church. Quick, how can we cover for this on the fly. Another nut shot and Hogan hits a leg drop. Out comes nephew Horace with a steel chair in hand and a bunch of steel staples in his head. Warrior starts coming back, hitting those clotheslines. Eric Bischoff shows up and grabs the referee, allowing Horace to enter the ring and whomp Warrior with the chair. Hogan gets the cover and the win and now finally everything's even Steven between Hogan and Warrior. Hogan tells Horace he's passed the test. Now let's set fire to him brother dude Jack. As Captain Activating as it would have been to light the warrior ablaze, security breaks it up. Eric Bischoff's like, how dare you stop us from killing this man? I, I still can't get over Horace. Just, just the absolute worst. Negative five stars. Pat Patterson on his best day couldn't have saved this rematch. I mean, you know, I'm not the first person to talk trash about this matchup. It's not even the first time I've done it. I'm, that's why I'm doing this five years after the review. But every time I watch it, somehow this matchup gets worse every time. And you know what? There have been objectively like clunkier, shittier matches that I've seen between two individuals, but none as big in terms of star power and stature as Hogan and Warrior together. I've seen bad Warrior matches. I've seen bad Hogan matches, but none of them can compare to the sheer awfulness of these two coming together eight and a half years after WrestleMania VI. It's just not there anymore. The fans on one level don't seem to care. They don't care the same way they cared for Hogan and Piper at Starcade 96. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the warrior is just not a relatable human being, not a relatable character. He starts off here and has nowhere else to go but down. And so I think that's why Piper and Hogan, for instance, was a lot more riveting for people than H Hogan Warrior. And of of course you see how it plays out and even for all of Piper's faults for having the hip surgery and the giant scar they still pull off a better matchup than what Hogan and Warrior do here uh, you know for the level of hype this match got for the level of stature and star power these two have for the match to go as poorly as it did especially because of that fireball spot it is 
unforgivable. And for some people watching this live, this was how the show ended. Wee! But for the rest of them, this was the main event for the WCW Championship. Goldberg defending against Diamond Dallas Page. DDP won the right to face Goldberg by winning the War Games match the previous month. Page is the people's champion of WCW. He is arguably the top babyface not named Goldberg. At this point, you know, the Diamond Cutter is one of the most popular moves, second only to the Spear and the Jackhammer, pretty much. I mean, even Sting's not getting the kind of reactions DDP is at this point. And he is one of those underdog characters where you've seen him come up through everything over the years, come up through so much adversity throughout the lower card and the mid card. The 800 matches he had with Johnny B. Bad, the issues with the Diamond Doll, losing all his money, gaining it, you know, all that stuff. It's We've seen the journey of Diamond Dallas Page over the years. And it's really culminating in a special period of time for him as a competitor, where he's this underdog, but he is cunning, he is tough, he is the master of the diamond cutter, and if anybody can beat Goldberg and break the streak, at this point, it's DDP. Michael Buffer with the intros here, but we've also seen him on the last two or three nitros, so is it really that special? This match is hot from the get-go. Just the intensity of those opening lockups alone is something else. DDP on the attack early on, but Goldberg just shoves Page out of the ring. Even a shoulder tackle sends Page flying, but he's able to stick and move to gain the advantage. Goldberg overpowers the challenger. Page still able to kick out and escape submission attempts. Goldberg goes for a spear. Page dodges it, and Goldberg temporarily KOs himself by running into the post. A slam is countered into a DDT by DDP, but Page taking a nice crisp spear soon afterward. Berg's shoulder is too hurt, though. He tries to get Page up, but it's time for my favorite move on the planet. The diamond cutter. Shoulders back, chest out. Huge pop by the crowd for that move, but Page takes too long to cover and Goldberg kicks out. And you know what? I, and I know a lot of other people would say this, if there was ever a time besides Nash at Starcade to end the streak, it would have been that moment right there. A suplex attempt is countered into a jackhammer. We get a cover and the win. The streak continues for Goldberg and at least we end with sportsmanship. I give it four stars out of five. This was a great main event, especially compared to the dumpster fire of the previous match in Hogan Warrior. I mean, it's a testament to both guys here. This is easily the best title match of Goldberg's run as champion. It's one of Diamond Dallas Page's more high profile matches. And I think that you've got a guy in Goldberg who's still relatively green. You've got a guy in DDP who famously, you know, mapped out his matches to the letter more often than not and doesn't give a lot of room for like spontaneity or, you know, covering things up if things go wrong. But that wasn't really an issue in this matchup. For Goldberg to have a 10 minute match at this point in his career and for him to not trip all over himself and fall on his face was a really big accomplishment. And so I think Goldberg deserves a lot of credit for this. DDP deserves a lot of credit as well for keeping things together. And like I said, if, you know, that diamond cutter was the move that put Goldberg away and ended the streak, then, you know, I would have been happy with that. Even back then, I thought that should have happened then. And you know what? You know, we can talk about that stuff, you know, until the cows come home. We're still talking about it 25 years later. But, I mean, that just really tells you, I think, how big and how good of a match this was. And, you know, uh, considering some other mess stuff we'd seen on this show, this was just a real sweet way to end it. Face versus face, it could go horribly wrong, but it didn't. It worked out really well, and it was a great match. But like I said, a lot of fans actually missed it as it aired live due to the pay-per-view satellite window not being long enough. Depending on who you talk to, either WCW planned things to go long or they didn't notify the pay-per-view company or things were going long and they needed more time. I mean, again, you can look at this show in hindsight and look at a bunch of different things you could kind of pick and take away to help make that time up if that was an issue. Watching it back now with all this hindsight, it doesn't feel like it's a bad show show in terms of pacing and timing. It's just, you know, it's got a lot of promos and a lot of dance breaks, but you could obviously see now in like looking back, oh, they just made it kind of a bigger episode of Nitro, the way they kind of structured it. And of course we can say that now, but back then obviously there were some more dire and more serious financial repercussions to come from this because a lot of these fans that didn't get the show ending, they called and want to get refunds. So a lot of fans got their money back and that ended up costing WCW, you know, at least a million dollars easily. No official number has been put out, but people have done the math out there. 
there. It's like, yeah, you're looking at at least seven figures easily for the amount of refunds that uh, were distributed. And of course, WCW would try and correct this. They would show the main event in its entirety the following night on Nitro. And it did do a Bafo TV rating for them on that week, which would be the last time Nitro ever beat Raw in the rating. So it's kind of bittersweet in that way. My grade for Halloween Havoc 1998 was then and remains today a D plus. You know, it's clear that my opinion on this show hasn't really changed all that much since I did the review, but it is fun to go back and rewatch it with a bit of added context and having watched that TV build to really get a better sense and a flavor of what it was like at the time and you know, trying to refresh my memory there with WCW. It's an entertaining show in a lot of ways, but there's also a lot of misfires. And yes, Hogan and Warrior is dragging this grade down by an awful lot, and I maintain it's because of the size of the stars and the amount of height that match got for it to end the way that it did, and really not just end, for it to just be the way that it was is absolutely disgraceful, honestly. And Warrior, of course, would not last much longer in WCW. He had one more appearance or so on Nitro, and that was pretty much it. Um, yeah, the things that I liked about the show, the things I didn't like, are pretty much the same as they were before. I gotta give Disco Inferno his props for, you know, working two matches so close to each other and delivering there. Of course, DDP and Goldberg, a strong match as well. If you're a fan of wrestling from this vintage, whether it's WWF or WCW, you'll still get a kick out of watching this show. It is, there are a lot of so bad it's good elements to this thing. It just really shows you for all the good that there was in WCW at this time and for all the good business they were still producing, things in this company were still a little bit in disarray, and this show was a bit of a microcosm of that. Well, I hope you enjoyed this revisit of a classic pay-per-view review. What did you think of Halloween Havoc 98? Let me know in the comments section below. Hey, you know what? There's still a lot of perma-blocked videos I've got in the archives here that I am going to slowly but surely chip away at and re-bring them to you in a way that maybe they weren't originally intended, but maybe a better way to try and dodge that tricky YouTube algorithm. But until then, folks, be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Comment below, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and hit that bell icon to get all the notifications. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.